Hi, I'm Sean Pinder from the Department of Finance. It gives me great pleasure to provide you with this presentation on a key decision that finance professionals around the world face on a day-to-day -day basis, the financing decision. That is, how should companies structure the financing to enable the purchase of an asset? In reviewing this decision, we're going to concentrate on two key questions. Firstly, what effect might the financing decision have on the wealth of the owners of the new asset? Secondly, what are some of the factors that might encourage or deter firms from adopting particular forms of financing? To illustrate the impact of the financing decision, let's set you up as the prospective owner of a new business. This business involves the brewing and delivery of craft beer throughout the city of Melbourne. You anticipate that you'll need $2 million of capital to set up your business. Now, fortunately, you will already have saved $1 million on your own, but you need to work out where to get the additional $1 million. There are two options that are available to you. You can bring in a partner, Jerry, who's an entrepreneur, who's keen to take a 50% stake in the business. Alternatively, you can borrow the $1 million from Susan, your friendly corporate banker, who's willing to lend you the money at an interest rate of 10% per annum. So, on the one hand, you can take on a partner and use their funds to fund the business. Now, this is a form of capital known as equity capital. The alternative that we have in this example is to borrow the money from a bank, where these funds are referred to as debt capital. The next step is to analyse the wealth effects of these two alternatives. But before doing that, we need some measures of the possible performance of the business over the next year. Now, let's assume for the sake of this illustration that there are three possible states of the world that will materialise over the next year. The expected outcome is that the business delivers net cash flows, after all operating expenses, of $300,000. The other two possibilities are that things will turn out fantastically well for our business, in which case we forecast a net cash flow of $600,000 at the end of the year. Whilst on the downside, if the market for craft beer tanks, then we expect that our business will only generate $100,000. Now let's have a look at the impact of the different financing choices on your own returns. So let's have a look at what happens if you take Jerry in as a partner. Not unexpectedly, what happens is that the net cash flows that are generated by the business are split equally between the two of you, so that your claim on the cash flows range from $50,000 in the poor state of the world up to $300,000 if we outperform expectations. Now, because we contributed $1 million to the business, we can express these cash flows as a rate of return, ranging from 5% to 30% for the year. Now let's look at what happens if you use debt capital instead. The key with debt capital is that lenders get paid their interest before the owners of the company can claim a return. In this example, the bank set an interest rate of 10% on a loan of $1 million, and as a result, the interest paid by the firm, no matter what state of the market we face, is $100,000. In the poor state of the world, all of the cash generated has been captured by the bank, leaving us with a return of nothing for the year. Under the expected state of the world, only 100,000 out of the 300,000 generated is paid out and you get to keep the remaining $200,000. Whilst in the great state of the world, you get to hold on to a whopping half a million dollars. So what's going on here? Here we have a table summarising the rates of return generated on your $1 million investment under either of the two financing scenarios. Firstly, if we take Jerry on as a partner, your expected return from your $1 million investment is 15% and your returns will range from 5 to 30%, depending upon the state of the market for craft beer. If you borrow from Susan at the bank at a rate of 10%, for the year, then your expected return is higher at 20%. This will always be the case if the rate of return expected to be generated by your assets is greater than the interest rate charged by lenders. Now, the next thing to notice is especially important. You can see that your returns are much more volatile or riskier once you introduce debt onto the scene. 
Now your returns will range from 0% to 50%, a much greater variation than if you had have taken Jerry on board as an equal partner. This increase in volatility is what we refer to as financial risk and simply reflects the increase in the variability of your returns as a consequence of introducing debt as a source of finance. The final point to make with respect to this example is that we've ignored taxes here, but more on this in a moment. So what are some other influences that we should account for when considering why investors make the financing decisions that they do? In addition to the impact of introducing debt on the financial risk of the firm, there are a whole host of other influences on the investor's financing decision. For example, some assets provide better debt capacity than others. That simply implies that lenders are willing to lend more funds to an investor with assets that are easily sold off if the investor gets into financial distress sometime down the track. For example, tangible assets like warehouses or real estate or delivery trucks and so on, these are relatively easy to sell off. On the other hand, other assets such as trademarks or goodwill or other examples of intangible assets represent a much more difficult prospect to sell off and pay back debt. Another influence on an investor's decision to borrow funds from a lender is that the lender might actually impose certain restrictions on what the investor can and can't do with the money. And they may also restrict how the investor conducts their business into the future. And this can lead to an investor shying away from borrowing money and instead preferring to use equity capital. Our third example of another influence is the impact of taxes. Interest expense in Australia is deductible for tax purposes. Now this means that any dollar paid out as interest can be claimed as an allowable tax deduction, thereby reducing the cash generated by the company's assets that is lost to the government. Now this can help to explain why historically firms around the world have been attracted to using debt even when they have sufficient cash on hand to not only fund all desired projects, but to also pay back much of their outstanding debt. This characteristic of debt is known as the interest tax shield, so called because the interest deduction claimed reduces or shields them from the tax that the investor would otherwise have to pay. In this presentation, I've introduced you to only some of the issues that investors consider when making a decision about how to finance the acquisition of an asset. Now we've only scratched the surface here. There are a whole host of other financing decisions facing investors. Decisions such as if we're going to borrow funds, should we borrow using long-term or short-term debt? Should we borrow at a fixed or at a variable rate? If interest rates are lower overseas, should we consider borrowing there rather than borrowing domestically? Or if we're not going to use debt but raise equity instead, should I bring new partners in or just reinvest the funds that have already been generated by the asset? Or thinking on a grander scale, perhaps we should consider listing our business on the stock exchange. And then we can look at raising capital by issuing shares out there in the market. All of these are serious questions that require finance professionals to be equipped with the tools necessary to provide practical and timely advice to investors, be they sole traders of a small home business or multinational, multi-billion dollar conglomerate companies thinking about how best to structure their financing to maximise the value of the company's assets.